Welcome to Late Night Cocktails. I'm your host, L.A. Wade. Today, Late Night Cocktails is taking you on a ride through the mythology of the Black Phallic Fantastic, a psychosocial reading of Black masculinity in Western art and cinema. We're also going to be teasing out some other themes that are impacting the construction of the Black man. We all know how much I love the Black man. These themes derive from a book called Appealing Because He is Appalling, Black Masculinities, Colonialism, and Erotic Racism, published by the University of Alberta Press. Coming up in just the tip, and to get a better understanding of the themes in the book, I will be introducing Dr. Tamari Katosa. Dr. Tamari Katosa is an associate professor in the sociology department at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. He specializes in anti-blackness and the African image in Western culture, anti-criminology, and the sociology of knowledge. He is a contributor and co-editor to three important books, the first, African-Canadian Leadership, Continuity, Transition and Change. Secondly, Nuances of Blackness in the Canadian Academia, Teaching, Learning and Researching. And of course, why we're all here today. He is a contributor, editor and curator of the book we are discussing, Appealing Because He is Appalling, Black Masculinities, Colonialism and Erotic Racism. Again, it was published by the University of Alberta Press. Tamara, before we get some of the other contributors from the book in our discussion, can you explain what is the Black Phallic Fantastic? Thank you. So the, the, the Black Phallic Fantastic is a myth. It's, it's a myth. It's three parts. First of it is that all black men are hypersexual. We love sex. We've never seen a sex that we didn't like, mm. whether we're gay, straight, or trans. Okay. Um, the other is that we are preapic or we have large penises. You don't? No. <laughs> Not all black I'm, men I'm, have large penises. No, we're, we're fully human. We run the <laughs> spectrum of, of all human males. Uh, and the third is the presumption that we are prone to commit rape. So there's a, these three things are packaged together and they constitute the myth uh, that enters before any black man enters a room. Can, okay, tell me how that has functioned in your own life. How have, like when a woman meets you, for example, is the presumption that you're going to be able to dominate her in bed with your large phallic and have this fantasy of her life? <laughs> well, yeah, so it can work that way or it could also work in the context of fear and loathing, but these are never separate. So the desire could also be the loathing of this object that's reduced to the status of their penis, which is what James Baldwin and Franz Fanon talked about, right. that black men are reduced to um, the image of sexual impropriety. Yeah, I, I, what I found interesting is the way in which I didn't recognize how much and how complicit the objectification of black men really is allowed to be there. and. You know, we always hear about women feeling like they've been, you know, in a patriarchy. This patriarchy, patriarchy, it's misogyny, it's holding me down. However, when women get together and they want to have a party, they want to like, you know, whoop it up with their girls around men and, and the objectification of them. But I feel like it's a carnival thing, like it's a mass thing where we're trying to take it back and own it in a different way. But I also believe that that comes out through, you know, white feminist movements and understanding ourselves separate from our co-oppressed, in a sense. So there's a lot of miscommunication that needs to um, be bridged, and I feel like this book is a wonderful window into being able to, to start the discussion of seeing black men as human, <laughs> as, a, as human. Uh, on Zoom, we are joined by Dr. Delroy Hall, a black British ordained minister, trainer, and psychodynamic psychotherapist, counselor with over 30 years of experience. He is the CEO of Dwells Consultancy, offering counseling, training, and seminars dealing with loss, grief, and bereavement, depression, anxiety, clergy stress, wow, clergy stress, black male suicide, and cultural competence. Dr. Hall is committed to dealing with human pain while developing trust so people can recover and thrive. He has contributed to, to the fourth chapter in, in the book, Beyond the Exotic and the Grotesque, Toward a Theology of Black Men and Radical Self-Love in the United Kingdom, to the newly edited book, which we are all celebrating today, the appealing, He is Appealing Because He is Appalling, Black Masculinities, Colonialism and Erotic Racism, published by the University of Alberta Press. Welcome, Dr. Hall. 
Thank you. Welcome, uh, LA and um, Dr. Tamari and Kader and, and everyone else is on, uh, on, on screen today. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Delroy, what should we understand in order to wrestle through the themes of your chapter? For example, what do you mean by erotic racism and specifically the grotesque? Sure. I, th I think it, it links into the term exotic, that um, my idea is that, I guess I've taken part of the idea from Dr. Cress Wilson, who had this idea of tall, dark and handsome. And wherever we seem to be as black men, either, I, I, as, I, as I see it, we're either um, adored or attracted to by usually white women or white gay men. But at the same time, we occupy the space of also being grotesque in the sense that we are seen as threats, we are not seen as um, images of beauty. And I guess for me, I, I was always wrestling with the question, what have we done that's so wrong that we warrant such treatment? It was just a question that I had when I saw the plight of black men in America and the UK and so forth. I could think, what have, I, I could understand it if we committed great crimes, but it's as though we've done nothing, but yet we are the the kind of the victim or the object of which there's so much projection. Yeah, I, I would wrestle with that also. What I find interesting is the way that it's it's something that we it's not in our mind in our in our awareness to consider that I keep what this book keeps making me think about how is it that we are going to usher in a movement of black men articulating their feelings and it become normalized. I think about the, the women's movement. I think about the LGBTQ movement and the way that there was a lot of, you know, objectives and things that they wanted to get across. And, and I never thought of this as a movement, but it is a movement because I'm hearing a lot more black men say that they're tired. They, they, they don't want it anymore. No more of this. And, and I think it's going to take a real learning of society because of how dehumanized you are. It's so outside of the periphery of, of people's consciousness to be able to see you. <laughs> and I never realized that as much as when I was reading through this book and having these conversations with black men who are courageous enough to share that experience. So I really thank both of you for contributing to this book, for creating this book, and I'm loving the fact that in the next segment, we're gonna get to dialogue with people who have been impacted in their regular life to theorize it and to uh, give them language because I think that a large part of these movements is that there's been language that they can use and now you're providing language and that's a powerful thing, so thank you. Um, so I want you to continue on with, the, with your exposition. So for me, the whole thing around black masculinity is not an interest, so, so over here in the UK, you have lots of therapists who say, oh, that sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. Well, for me, this is not an interest. This is an existential concern. <laughs> it's one of, it's, it's a life or death situation. So this is not an interest for me that when I get to 65, I'll ditch it because I'm no longer working. This is something that's going to be with me for the rest of my life. How do we as black men, um, and I think we have to start at an individual level, maybe, how do we mobilize ourselves that we're living in a hostile environment that really dehumanizes us, how can we get to the place whereby we have that strength where it no longer affects us the way that it has done in time past? And, and for me, if we're waiting for government initiatives and all that type of thing, we'll be waiting from now to the end of the earth. So we have to take uh, the bull by the horns, the, the, the reins, and begin to start working on ourselves and develop this whole thing around self-love for the benefit of us not for the benefit of other people. Yes, and self-love is very taboo when it comes with in this, in this context of black male, maleness. Um, so I want to talk to some real life people. So let's, let's meet the black men who are courageous enough to share with vulnerability and transparency with us today. I salute every king that will touch the stage today. Um, and I would like to introduce you one by one to the people that will be having this wonderful discussion. Online with us is uh, Kadar. Uh, Kadar, would you like to introduce yourself and, um, and give us your first thoughts of, of the book? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Kadar Olamide. Um, I currently am based in, in Tennessee. And um, in, in reading the book, I think it gave a very good insight 
as to some of the current issues that plague us as Black men uh, surrounding our sexuality and masculinity. Um, it, definitely eye-opening, you know, some things I, I was not aware of, some things that I did not expect to, uh, to encounter in the book, but um, overall a, a very good read and a very explorative uh, book in detail uh, regarding you know, Black masculinity and sexuality. Amazing, thank you. I'll be right with you. I'd like to now introduce Corey Kareem, and um, he's gonna start off our Pandora's box, uh, along with Rocco and Champong. Mm -hmm.